Good morning, everybody. Um, you'd be pleased to know that my voice is failing. And um, <clears throat> you'll also be happy to know that Andrew kindly helped me a few days ago just to put together an eight-minute um, visual of Easter. But before we go there, if I could ask you to solemnly, sincerely, honestly, are you listening to me? Yes. Honestly, think hard about how loved you are. Because you cannot go through Easter and dare believe that God doesn't care. And whatever might be the sufferings, the pain, the challenges, God's been there before you in His Son, Jesus Christ. So we are not talking to a God who's a million miles away. He's one dimension. He's crossing through the veil. He's right up close, closer than your very borrowed breath. Right? So I'm appealing to you as we come into this most glorious season that you take serious just a few moments to consider whether you really, really do respect the cross, the sacrifice. So that we can come from darkness into light. That's all God wants for that which he loves from the bottom of his heart, you and me. Would to God we would love ourselves like God loves us. There's so much out there in our toxic, worrying enterprise that seeks to demean our humanity. But we are, in all creation, God's prize. Amen. Amen. So when we go through this brief story, I want you to be very personal. And I want you to respond in your heart to the Holy Spirit. And if you're struggling and you feel a million miles away from God, I'm telling you something now. I hope you're not talking when I'm talking. I'm telling you something now you need to be up close and personal in response to the Lord. It's so real. The first day I encountered the cross, I broke my heart because I didn't realize how beautiful God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is. And every time we would sing about the cross, I would break my heart. Not because I was sad, but because I was profoundly moved by the reality that the ruler of the universe is the creator of your very breath. And that's what's so real. You don't hear much about the cross in our modern toxic age. It's worrisome. You don't hear about it in the church. I remember one guy coming to me and saying to me, why do you preach about the cross? Why is that relevant? That was a fellow Christian. So I come to you today. This is not a cinema. It's a moment of reflection. Are you hearing me? It's a moment of reflection. And so whatever might be the interruptions, God's got everything in hand. Just, you just be at peace right now, at peace. God's got everything in hand. But let's just focus on what the Lord is wanting to do and to say. 
This is the holiest of all the celebrations of the Christian calendar. Hello? Amen. Are you ready then? You'll hear a better voice on this script that we're going to have right now. Thank you. Center screen. In the woven vastness of time, amid the sacred pages of scripture, there unfolds a tale of boundless triumph and deep redemption. It is the Easter story. Isaiah, with prophetic vision, spoke of a Messiah who would stand resolute, who is coming from Edom, from Basra, with his garment stained crimson. Who is this robed in splendor, striving forward in the greatness of his strength? It is I proclaiming victory, mighty to save. Why are your garments red like those of one treading the winepress? I have trodden the winepress alone. From the nations no one was with me. I trampled them in my anger and trod them down in my wrath. Their blood spattered my garments and I stained all my clothing. Isaiah 63 verses 1 to 3. This imagery finds its echo in Revelation, where Jesus emerges as the victorious conqueror. He's dressed in a robe dipped in blood, and his name is the Word of God, Revelation 19.13. This Messiah, adorned in crimson victory, with justice he judges and wages war. His eyes are like blazing fire, and on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows but he himself. He is dressed in a robe dipped in blood, and his name is the Word of God. And the armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen, white and clean. Revelation 19, 11 to 14. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John 1, 29. John the Baptist's words pierce the ages, heralding the Lamb whose sacrifice would cleanse all of humanity. As the specter of the cross loomed ever closer, the very air seemed to thicken with tension. In a moment of profound foreboding, Jesus unveiled the path that lay before him, a path steeped in suffering and sacrifice. Peter, ever the protector, recoiled at the thought, his words echoing with unintended temptation. Never, Lord, he said, this shall never happen to you. Matthew 16:22. But Jesus, perceiving the shadow of the enemy in Peter's fearful plea, rebuked him. Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Matthew 16, 23. Here, in this poignant exchange, the narrative deepens, revealing the enemy's acute awareness of the seismic shift Jesus' sacrifice would usher in. It was a moment that underscored the cosmic battle raging silently beneath the surface. A battle over destiny, victory, and the very heart of redemption itself. Gethsemane's hallowed ground bore witness to the Saviour's profound solitude, a testament to his unwavering resolve. Here, though the scriptures don't narrate the arrival of angels in Gethsemane with specific dialogue, they were present, not to take the cup from him, 
but to strengthen his heart for the path he chose to walk, a path that led through the shadow of death and to the brilliance of resurrection. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearer is silent, so he did not open his mouth. Isaiah 53, 7. This imagery, rich with the gentleness and submission of a lamb, finds its profound fulfillment as Jesus, embodying the ultimate Lamb of God, is led to the High Priest. Matthew 26, 57. The Greek word used for being led resonates deeply with the image of a shepherd who gently ties a rope around a lamb, guiding it to sacrifice. It's a gesture of both care and destiny, symbolizing Jesus, willing submission to the Father's will, a path that would lead to the ultimate sacrifice for humanity's redemption. As he stands before the high priest, we are reminded of the accurate fulfillment of scripture, a testament to the meticulous orchestration of divine prophecy and its fulfillment in Jesus Christ. And then, upon the third day, there was a violent earthquake. For an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and, going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. Matthew 28, verse 2. When Mary Magdalene came upon him, her heart alight with recognition, his gentle caution, do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father to my God and your God, John 20, 17, was a whisper of sacred reverence, a moment of holiness, as profound as a high priest entrance into the Holy of Holies, a once a year moment, now fulfilled in him. The Easter story, woven from the threads of tension, temptation, and ultimate triumph, he invites us into a reflection of sacrifice and resurrection. In this narrative of victory, may we find our hope, our redemption, and our assurance in the eternal triumph of our Saviour, Jesus Christ, and none other. Amazing grace how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found. Was blind, but now I see. Twas grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace. My fears relieved How precious did That grace appear The hour I first believed I love, I love the words of Jesus when he said to Thomas, you believe because you've been able to touch me. 
For blessed are those who have not seen me, but have believed. I'm a believer. Are you a believer? Say, I'm a believer. If you are, I'm a believer. Knock somebody over to your left and your right. Remind them. I'm a believer. But this is how, this is how God fulfilled what he had foretold through the prophets, saying that the Messiah would suffer. It is beyond mere human comprehension what God had planned to transform the destiny of fallen man. I have a destiny. Do you have a destiny? If you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior and as your friend, what's the problem? He's only a prayer away. Don't try and tidy it all up. I passed a little video out to some close family members about a preacher who was saying, I can't wait to get to heaven to speak to the man who was on the cross. And Jesus said, this day you shall be with me in paradise. I want to be able to ask him, how did he get on getting into paradise? And this is what he said. He got to paradise and the angel said, are you a believer? He said, I'm a believer. He said, did you go to church? Never. Didn't go to church. And then he said, did you read the Bible? I didn't have a Bible. Then I best just get my chief angel and ask him to check you out a bit more. So he brought the chief angel. And the chief angel said to him, do you know any text in the Bible? He said, no. He said, then, what are you doing here? And this he said, the man on the middle cross, the man on the middle cross invited me to come. And so I'm here. The Lord invites you. Stop making excuses. Stop fighting inside yourself. Stop trying to be bigger than God. Humble yourself. And if you don't know the Lord, take a good look at the cross. Take a good look at the way he was treated by religious people, by politicians, by people in power who couldn't care less about whether there is a God. It's toxic. Well, I've got good news for you today. He's risen. Yeah. And he's risen indeed. Yeah. Amen.